11 and a half years. Um, yeah, we've been, we have been packing things and going through things and finding stuff we haven't seen in years. Um, I was packing up my office and you know, one year for my birthday, Missy posted a bunch of post-its around the office and some were hidden so I didn't find them all on that day. And so randomly I'll open something or I'll turn something over and I'll find a, a sticky note with the message. And I took down my clock on the wall. I had no reason to remove my clock for a long time. Um, but I took my clock off the wall and there was a sticky note on the back of it that was written in February of 2017. And it says something to the effect of, so you're rearranging or maybe we're even moving. And if we are, just know that I'm with you and whatever the Lord has for us, we're together. And so that was one of those moments, you know, that was written five years ago. And so I found a lot of them and that's the only one I didn't find until just recently. And so it's like God saved that one for that moment so I would know that he already knows. You know, he knew long ago what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. I also came across a lot of things that, um, you know, I'm just sitting at my desk and, and crying a lot this week. So, um, you know, more than I ever have before. I keep all the cards that people have given me, uh, unless they're bad notes and I throw those away. But I keep all the good ones. Uh, and fortunately, I had a pretty big stack of cards and notes um, over the past 11 years. And so I kept all those. I still have them. I packed them in a box because I still want to go through those. When I'm having bad days, I, they, they used to sit right to my left of my desk. And I would just pull them out, read a few, and say, okay, people don't hate me. It's okay. And, you know, I would tear up my resignation letter. And uh, No, I never did that. But I did read those cards and those notes several times. So I'm packing stuff. And I'm going through it because, you know, I don't want to take stuff I don't need, so I'm throwing stuff away. I'm taking stuff to the hope chest. And, and I came across, a few days ago, I came across uh, two things. I came across a journal. Uh, I've got a lot of journals, but I came across a journal, and the very first entry in the journal uh, was July 30th, 2011. That was the day before I officially candidated at this church. I was voted in on July 31st, and so Saturday, July 30th, we were at the Super 8 Motel here in town, um, getting ready to, to preach that next Sunday morning and, and see if St. Ignis Assembly of God was going to vote us in or going to say, sorry, bud, uh, take a hike. Um, and so I want to share a little bit of what I wrote. You know, this, this series has been called famous, not so famous last words. Well, these are actually not so famous first words. These are the first words that I really spoke concerning this church I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I will read some excerpts. It says, It's the night before I officially candidate to be the pastor of St. Ignis Assembly of God. Needless to say, I'm feeling a lot of different emotions. I'm excited, I'm sad, I'm scared, I'm anxious, and probably more. I know God will provide, but I definitely worry that I'm doing the right thing for my family. Anyway, I doubt that I'll sleep much tonight. I really just wish Missy and I could have some time alone because I think we need that. I know you're there with me though, Lord. Help me keep my focus and my confidence in you. I never expected to be candidating as a lead pastor. It was never, quote unquote, my plan. But here I am. And then I wrote, I was getting comments at the time because I was a youth pastor. And so I wrote this. I says, I'm getting tired of the comments about not having a heart for youth anymore. I know people don't mean it maliciously, but it's frustrating. I don't want the teens to think that we're leaving because I don't have a heart for them. All I know is that you've called us, and all I can do is be obedient. So here we go. Lead the way, and I will try to follow. Thank you for all you are and all you do. I love you. And I thought it ironic that now God is leading me back to teens to teach them to help them fall in love with Jesus through the word in a little bit different way than I did before. I used to say to parents when I was a youth pastor, I said, I've only got your kids for a couple hours a week. You got to do the hard work. You know, you, they're going to be much more under your influence. 
And that's still the case, but now I actually do have them a lot more than a couple hours a week. I'll get to see them five days a week, ten months a year, with the chance, the opportunity to pour into them and to still pass through them. Not just to teach them stuff, but hopefully to offer them a safe person to talk to when they need someone to talk to, to help them fall in love with Jesus through the Word of God. And so, of course, that was one of those moments that I, as I read through that, uh, just reminisced about that day. And I was quite nervous. Uh, I had not been a lead pastor before. I didn't know if I could do it. I made a lot of mistakes along the way, and you guys have been so gracious. And then I also came across in the same day, probably about an hour after I found this, I came across the very first message I ever preached here. It was on September 11th, 2011. It was the 10-year anniversary of 9-11. See, we were, we were voted in on J July 11th, but we had to, you know, move. So we moved here officially on August 31st, 2011, the week uh, right before Labor Day, a few days before Labor Day. So that first Sunday, Dean Elliott was here to preach um, so that I didn't have to come and, and go right to work. And so my first Sunday was that following Sunday, September 11th. And I'm not going to share that message, but I do want to share a few things from it because I think it still is relevant today. The title of it was called No Plan B. And it was, the focus was James chapter 1. And James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And so we spent a lot of time talking about what does it mean to face our trials with joy? Like who, who considers it pure joy to go through hard stuff? But the point was that by going through trials, you mature and you, you become complete in Christ and you develop perseverance. And when our, faith is, when our faith goes through the fire, it typically comes out the other side much stronger. And so I just want to share a few things from, from that message. I talked about how even though it's, it's been 10 years at that time, uh, from 9-11, most of the country had pretty much moved on unless you were directly affected by it and had gotten back to normal. It didn't cause the country to turn to God for protection. It did in the very beginning. There were some ripples of that, but that didn't last long. Or to eliminate party lines and work together for a common cause. We know that that certainly hasn't happened still. Because everyone has their own ideas and their own plans for their lives. Yet God tells us trials will come to even the strongest of Christians and no matter who you are, you will face them in your life. Trials are most often situations that occur that are largely out of our control and not the result of sin. The purpose of our trial, says James, is to cause us to mature and to become complete in Christ, not lacking anything. And the process for facing trials are to do it one with joy, because the testing of faith produces perseverance, so the second is to process it with perseverance, which means patient endurance. And then lastly, with prayer. James says to ask for wisdom, but as when you ask for wisdom, we must believe and not doubt. That's the only condition. Just believe that if you ask for wisdom, God will give it to you. And James goes on to say he'll give it generously, to all who ask without reserve and he will give without condemnation. He will give without finding fault as long as we believe and don't doubt. Because when we act according to the flesh, not waiting for God's direction or God's answer, it's a sign that we're doubting that God will give us what we need, when we need it, and how we need it. I thought that was a pretty good message. That was the first one I preached here. And today's isn't a lot different as far as the, the tone of the message and the last thing that, that I want to say to you. Just a quick recap in this series, not so famous last words. The first week it was choose this day. We looked at the story of the Israelites sending the spies to the promised land and most of them did not choose to believe God, to trust God. And Moses' generation missed out on the promised land 
except for Caleb and Joshua, and Joshua became the one to lead them. But it was choose this day to trust God's promises, to stand with your leaders the way Caleb and Joshua did, and to serve the Lord. Right, Joshua's, some of his final words, choose this day whom you will serve. And we brought out this stone as a covenant, the same one that we all signed, many of us signed about 10 years ago when we had a vision of a new building and now many of you have signed it again as a sign that you're trusting for your next pastor, that you're going to stand with them in whatever God has for the next season for Lighthouse Assembly. The second week, it was open your eyes. We looked at the story of Elisha and the king of Aram wants to come and, and attack Israel. And the servant of Elisha is looking and he says, Master, there, there are so many of them. There's horses and chariots and armies. And Elisha says, there are more with us than are with them. And then Elisha said to the Lord, please open my servant's eyes. And his eyes were open and he saw in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm, he saw the angels, the spiritual armies, the heavenly armies surrounding Elisha. And so it was open your eyes to see that God is with you. And even when you can't always see it, just know in your heart and in your mind that God is with you because he promises us that. Open your eyes to see the blindness of others. Right, Elisha, he went to that enemy army and, and he prayed that the Lord would blind their eyes and he did. And Elisha leads them right into the heart of Israel, right in front of the king of Israel. They open, their eyes are opened and it's like, oh, crap. We're in front of the king of Israel. They're probably expecting to be attacked. And the king of Israel even says, Father, he's talking to Elisha, Father, can we, can we kill them? Should we kill them? And Elisha says, no. Instead, we're going to feed them. We're going to give them a great feast and then send them back. And there is peace among those, those two countries for an extended period of time. So it was open your eyes to see that God is with you. Open your eyes to see that others around us are blind. And open your eyes to the ways of the kingdom. Right? When Elisha told them, no, we're not going to kill them. We're going to feed them and send them back. And then last week, the, the, the not-so-famous last words were to be one as the Father and Jesus are one. We looked at Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17. And he repeated this phrase, Lord, Father, let them be one as you, in, or you are in me and I am in you. Let them be one as we are one. He said that multiple times. So be one as the Father and Jesus are one in speech, in action, and in heart. And I shared a brief illustration about that phrase, not one iota's difference. And those two, those two Greek words, homoousios and homoousios. Homoousios means of similar substance. There was this, there was this debate. There were those who believed that Jesus was created by Father God, that he was not God and did not exist forever. And so that word homoousios, with that, with that I, that iota, it changed the meaning of who Jesus was significantly. Jesus isn't of similar substance. He is of the same substance. He is God. And so the Nicene Creed came to be and, and most, right, the foundation of Christianity is that, that Jesus is God. But I made this statement. I said, we are of similar substance to God. Right? We are created in his image, but we are not God. But we are of the same substance as one another. And so we are called by God to be one, just as the Father and the Son are one. We are called to this unity as the church, not as the Assembly of God Church or as the Catholic Church, but as the church, big C. And that's something that is severely lacking in our culture today. Well, today, if I can get through it, the message is called, It Is Finished. Simple, it is finished. Comes out of John chapter 19 and verse 25. We'll get there in just a second. Would someone like to, uh, one last time, pray an anointing prayer over me before I speak? Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> Lord, I just... Uh... 
I ask you to uh, anoint Kevin today, uh, anoint his, his words to speak to us in a way that's uh, the way that we understand. Um, and bless the rest of the sermon. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. John chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 25. We are at the crucifixion of Jesus or just before his death. But he's on the cross. It says this. It says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. There's a lot of Marys in that group. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Lord, speak to us today. Open our eyes that we would see your presence, our ears to hear your voice and our hearts to receive your message. Lord, may I rightly divide your, your word one more time here at Lighthouse Assembly. And may you speak to us so clearly. May we walk out of this place different than when we came in because we've encountered you. We've encountered your word. We've encountered your presence. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is finished. May Jesus, his famous last words from the cross, it is finished as recorded by the Apostle John. But I started a little before that because this is a significant thing that I think often we, we kind of breeze by. But Jesus is on the cross. He is being crucified. He's being killed and he looks down and he sees his mother. He sees Mary. And, and he knows in their culture that a, a widow to be taken, because by this time Joseph had, had died, and so Mary uh, was not married. And unless she had a, a male figure to speak for her, to, to care for her, she would not have been cared for as well as she should have. Because that's how their culture worked. And so even as Jesus was on the cross in excruciating pain from the stakes in his wrist and the crown of thorns on his head, he looks to his mother and he looks to John and he says, Mom, here's your son. And, and John, here's your mother. You take care of her. Well, why is that significant? Well, one, as I said, Mary is widowed. And without a male advocate, she would not have been properly cared for. But Jesus had brothers James is one of those who ends up becoming a leader of the Jerusalem church. But at this time, James was not a believer. I mean, imagine growing up as Jesus' brother. Pretty hard life. Why can't you be more like your brother? I, I can't. Like, he's literally God. I can't live up to that. And so he didn't believe that Jesus was who he says he was until after the resurrection. And so at this point... I think in Jesus' mind, he knew that the only one that could care for her the right way, understanding who he was and, and understanding what was happening, was John. John had lived with Jesus, had followed him for three years, had, had been at his, his right side, his right hand for all of that time. He was one of the inner circle. And so even as Jesus is dying, he is taking care of his mother, and so if Jesus, in the midst of being crucified, saw fit to take care of his mother, how much more will the resurrected Jesus see that you and me and my family and your family and the church are taken care of? If Jesus from the cross made sure that she was going to be okay, how much more does Jesus, who is not on the cross anymore, how much more will he take care of you today? Will he take care of me? How much more does he know what's going on and says, it's okay, I've got you? And there'll be a day when he says, church, here's your pastor, and pastor, here's the church. He will do that for you, so be patient. Don't rush, let God 
bring the right person. He knows, he knew a long time ago. And he's got your next leader already picked out. And so he cares for his mom in these last moments and then he, he knows that everything is done. He knows he's fulfilled his calling and he says those three words and they're, they're, it's not even an exclamation, it's just very kind of matter of fact. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit and his earthly body gave up its life until it returned a few days later in the resurrection. But what you have to understand is in Greek culture, whenever somebody owed someone else a debt, they would draw up this certificate, this certificate of debt to say what the debt was, how much was owed. But whenever that debt was finally paid in full, they would essentially write this word on it, teleo. Teleo, it's a legal term that basically means paid in full. Teleo, debt is paid in full. And just prior to Jesus' death, he says, it is finished. The Greek word there is telestai. It's a form of that word teleo, and it's in, in the Greek, it literally means it is finished. But what's, what's interesting is it's a legal term. And so there's no doubt that these, the Greek-speaking people that would, would have heard this, that were surrounding him, because Greek, the Greek culture was very much the, the, the influencing culture at that time, they would have understood that, that phrase, more than just him saying it's finished, they would have heard this, this legal phrase that Jesus was saying, the debt has been paid in full. He was putting a stamp on the certificate of debt that humanity owed because of their sin. And that stamp said, it is finished, it is paid in full, the debt is no more. Christ died so that the certificate of debt listing all of my sins and your sins could once and for all be marked, paid in full. Now what we saw in our discipleship class from the book of John is that this is significant for a lot of reasons because John uses a lot of legal language in his gospel. You could almost picture the book of John as being like this spiritual courtroom drama. And it starts out with humanity is the accused. The enemy, he's got, you know, the enemy's the accuser. He's got a case against us. And it's a rock solid case. There's nothing we can do about it. But along the way, God begins to put, these, put this picture together that, that Jesus becomes the accused. Jesus takes our place at the defendant's table. And then the Holy Spirit comes as an advocate or a counselor or a helper like the defense attorney. So now the Holy Spirit is sitting at the defense table with Jesus as the defender. And then in John chapter 5, Jesus says, The Father judges no one, but he gives all authority to judge to the Son. So not only is Jesus in the defendant's chair, but he's also in the judge's chair. How do you think Jesus is going to rule against Jesus? Jesus. This is, a court, this is a court case that is stacked in his favor. He's got the Holy Spirit defending him. He's got himself as the judge. And so this thing plays out. This, uh, the, the cross is essentially the court case. right? Jesus on that cross, he's representing humanity, representing our sin. He's crucified for that sin. His accusers give approval to his death and they expect a guilty verdict. However, the advocate speaks on his behalf and Jesus is judged as not guilty. But his payment is still accepted for our debts. And so humanity, we're not really declared not guilty, but we've been given it, it is finished, a debt paid in full stamp on our certificate of debt. And so now the accuser is in a bind because that debt has been paid in full and Jesus is not guilty and three days after the cross, he's raised from the grave. See, there is no longer any legal recourse. The enemy has no spiritual right to accuse you. Now he will, he will accuse you, he will try to deceive you, but the enemy has no recourse. He has no authority to cast judgment on you because the judgment has already been made. And that judgment was paid in full. 
your debt was already paid for. And because Jesus was not guilty, he did not remain in the grave. See, what's interesting is if you back up into chapter 18, this is where Jesus goes before Pontius Pilate. The chief priests, the, the leaders of you know, the Pharisees, they, they bring Jesus to the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate hears the case and he says, what charge have you brought against this man? And here's their response. It's in chapter 18, verse 30. Their response is, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Notice what they did. They don't have a charge. Like, what are you charging him with? Well, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't give him to you. It's like, no, that wasn't the question. What's the charge? They couldn't answer because they didn't have anything to charge him with. There was nothing Jesus had done that earned him an arrest and certainly did not earn him a crucifixion. And then it goes on further. Pontius Pilate says to them, why don't you take him and judge him according to your laws? And this is what they say. We have no legal right to execute anyone. They had no legal recourse to accuse Jesus or to execute him. And so they wanted someone else to do their dirty work. And they thought, when Jesus was on that cross, they thought their troubles were over. They thought they had gotten rid of the man and gotten rid of his movement. And really all that happened was it sparked the greatest movement this world has ever seen. A small group of, of young men believed that Jesus was who he said he was. And now millions upon millions of people across this world profess Christ as Savior because of that one moment. The court case is severely stacked in your favor. The enemy has no legal recourse. He has no authority. Now he will accuse you. And when, we get, when we're not in our right mind and we start to believe those lies... And then we start to take a punishment that we are not meant to take. We start to bring, bring condemnation on ourselves that Jesus says, I, I don't give this to you. Right, what's Paul say in Romans? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So yes, the enemy will accuse you. He will try to deceive you. But much like those Jews had no legal recourse Humans through faith in Christ will be justified. How do we know? Because of the resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits. The resurrection is the evidence of justice. Jesus was resurrected because he did not deserve death. And so too, he says, will all of humanity that trust in him, that believes in him, they will be resurrected because your debt has already been paid for. If someone came to you today and you had thousands of dollars in debt, whether it's credit card debt, whether it's loans, and they said, I want to pay all this right now. Well, what's, what's the catch? I just want you to believe that this is who I am. I want you to believe I'm the Savior. I want you to believe how many of us would, whatever I got to do to, to get rid of this debt, yes, please take it. All Jesus says is believe in me. Trust me. Follow the example I've given you and your debt will be wiped clean. But how many people say no thanks and they take their debt with them? Like it seems like a deal that no one would ever pass up, but why would anyone ever turn that down? Well, one, the flesh is powerful. The gospel message gets distorted. But here's the thing, no matter who your next pastor is, the truth of the gospel and the finality of what Jesus did on the cross does not change and it will never change. You, by believing in Jesus, your promised resurrection, your promised eternal life, your sin has been fully redeemed, it's been paid in full. It is finished. Like that, that, should have, that should elicit a pretty good response. It is finished and we, yes, Lord, thank you, it is finished. I don't have to carry this guilt. I don't have to carry this shame. I don't have to carry this debt. You have taken it from me. And all you gotta do is believe. All you gotta do is trust in what Jesus has done. 
But we get into those moments, don't we, where up here is that we, we believe, but our heart, the flesh, pulls us somewhere else. And then we come back and say, Lord, I don't know why. I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I didn't trust you. Like, the, the flesh is powerful. We understand that. But it doesn't change the fact that it is finished. It doesn't change the fact that all we have to do is trust in him. He will give you what you need, when you need it, and how you need it. But you've got to persevere. You've got to patiently endure. We are creatures that want what we want when we want it. And usually we want it now, right? <laughs> We've got instant coffee. Like we, we might, we, it's a microwave Christianity. Like pop it in for a little bit. Give me what I want. And sometimes it doesn't happen that way. In fact, a lot of times it doesn't happen that way. Because it's that journey. It's that relationship with Jesus. I just have two things I want to do. I want to pray for you. And right now, I just want to thank you. I put this note on the back, or had Aaron put this note on the back of the bulletins, just in case I couldn't get through it. How do you sum up 11 and a half years with a group of people that you love? with a group of people that you've walked through hard things together, you've, you've experienced joys, you've experienced victories, you've experienced some hard things. How do you sum up 11 and a half years? Uh, you can't, really. You certainly can't do it on, in a few minutes on a Sunday morning. But here's the best I can do for now. The words thank you are not merely enough to express our gratitude for these past 11 years. You have loved our family. You have loved this church. You have loved the community. And most importantly, you have loved Jesus well. We will remember this period of our lives as a special season. St. Ignis has been our home. Lighthouse Assembly has been our church. Our girls grew up here and in a very real sense, so did we. An old adage says, you never really know what you've got until it's gone. I think we know what we've got. And that's why it's hard. Because we will miss it dearly. Yet we trust God's leading, both for our family and for Lighthouse Assembly. Many of you have become very dear friends. And all of you have become family. No matter where life or the Lord takes us all, our calling remains the same. To reflect Jesus as his image bearers and to make disciples of all nations. We've worked to fulfill that great commission together for the last 11 years. Now let us continue to fulfill it as the Lord takes us our separate ways. We love you more, more than we could ever, ever express. Thank you for everything. And may God continue to bless Lighthouse Assembly until he returns. And so if I could one more time bless you, could I ask you to stand just for a moment? If that's too hard for you, that's fine. You can stay seated. I want to steal the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Ephesians because I don't know any better words than the words that Paul said. And so I pray this for you. For this, re for this reason, I have knelt before the Father time and time again. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and, how, and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for Lighthouse Assembly and all of its generations forever and ever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. It is finished. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how else to close. I'm just going to cry and you guys can <laughs> leave when you feel ready to leave. Thank you so much. That's all I can say. Thank you.